The title of my presentation is Optimization of the Cairo Highland Maze a Program. That is in Kenya. And maize is a staple food in Kenya. And uh, it is always milled and used as a corn meal. And uh, <clears throat> when we lack maize in Kenya, we always say there's no food, there's shortage of food, despite the fact that there could be other other foodstuffs like rice, bananas, and so on. So maize is a very important food in Kenya. Maize is grown on 2.1 million hectares per year, and the average yields stagger below two tons per hectare. You can see the graph on the right-hand side. Uh, the averages are below two tons per hectare, but in 2011, you can see that drop. And also in 2016, you can also see that drop. The drop in 2011 uh, should be because of the maize lethal necrosis, which attacked uh, the crop in Kenya during that year. And in 2016, that is when we started feeling the heat of the fall lamium, which came up during that time. That 5% of milk production uh, is, in, is in the highlands, in the Kenya highlands, and Calro Island maize jam plasm is unique. This segment is not covered by CGIAR, and Calro Highland maize program was established in 1930, and recognized breeders like Larry Dara and Steve Eberhardt of the USDA worked in the program in the mid 70s. Uh, we started partnering with the uh, EIB in 2019, and in October 2019, the breeding program gap assessments were done. In February 2020, improvement plan was developed, and in March 2020, we set up five priorities, which you can see listed there, and these five priorities were listed mainly because of improving the genetic gain equation, which you can see on the right-hand side. How uh, we started by developing the product profile, and the market segment here is white grain maize, and the variety we want to replace here is called H6213, which was released in 2004, and has been in the market for the last 16 years. It has a market share of 48%. And the product team here, <clears throat> the product, the, the, the traits we want to replace here are grain, we want to consider here are grain yield, maize lethal necrosis, drought, stock lodging, ear rot, and also producibility. The product team consisted of the director of crop breeding and also other staff. Uh, from different uh, specialities. Uh, another thing we considered was, was costing of, of operations. We had never done <coughs> any costing of operations in the program, and we used the University of Queensland breeding program costing tool. And from the table there, you can see self-pollination nursery had high cost per row, while trialing had uh, a low cost per row. The high cost centers <coughs> rounded around guarding, guarding the experimental fields. And we thought that we could evaluate commercial service providers to undertake this function. Then another high cost center was flowering data collection. We realized that flowering date has a high irritability. And we decided that we could choose one good site and collect our flowering data from this one good site. And that would help in reducing the cost. Then another one is taking the 200 kennel weight. And uh, for this one, we decided we, to, we could procure a seed counter and uh, use that to reduce the cost attached to this. And then we also realized that the 71% of, of the budget was for line development, and we decided that we could outsource this line development from CBH DH facility, which we are already using, and this would help in reducing the cost and also length of the breeding cycle, as seen in the breeding equation on the right-hand side. Adoption of BMS 
and retrospective genetic gains assessment. CALRO adopted BMS as the institutional data management system. And already CALRO has signed an agreement with IBP. We signed an agreement in 2018. And all our 2020 experiments were generated in BMS with IBP support. Historical data for the last 20 years have been curated and uploaded into BMS. And this can be available to CALRO management and other breeders in CALRO. Retrospective genetic gains assessment is being conducted on historical data. And the results which come out of this assessment will help us to decide on the breeding methods and the breeding tools to use to improve the genetic gain. And results uh, will be available by the end of 2020. We also looked at the digitization of breeding operations and equipment like packet printers, tag printers, handhelds, and seed counters have been ordered by EIB. And we use, we, when we use these ones, we improve selection accuracy, which is part of our genetic gains equation. Impacts, electronic data capture will aid in integration with BMS and printers will reduce time and cost for manual labeling because uh, all along we have been doing manual labeling and we find that the problem is that sometimes these labels are rained on and uh, at the end when we are collecting data, we get problems because some labels uh, get uh, 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 mutilated and rubbed. Seed counters will save the labor cost, which is a very high cost item. And the breeding, the, the, the team here consisted of three breeders from CALRO, and also we had uh, partners from EIB, CIMIT, and also IBP. And I think this partner, partnership will help in improving the Highland Maze program, which is a unique program in East Africa. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dixon, uh, for that very clear uh, presentation and very informative presentation. Um, we'll now open it up for questions, um, and I'll go through the chat. I don't see anything on the chat at the moment. Um, uh, Sam and Solomon, do we have anyone requesting to ask a question by video? Uh, if not, I, I will go ahead and, and ask a couple of questions to Dixon. Sure, I just um, cleared the queue in the moderation panel. So if anybody wants to ask by audio and video, please click uh, ask the chair and I'll put you straight through. Okay, so um, so Dixon, I, I can kick off and, and ask you a, a question. So, you know, you take, you're making a big effort to modernize your uh, maize breeding program. What is your vision for success? Where do you see the Calro Highland Maze Program in five to 10 years from now? Uh, what would um, a very good, modern, thriving breeding program look like to you? I think the modern, well, the modern program, we should you go towards using uh, genomic uh, tools to improve uh, the genetic equation. Because I know, I do not, we have not seen the results of the 20 years assessment, but I think at the moment we are already, uh, the, gen the, the, the genetic gain must be a bit low. We, are, we must have reached a plateau somewhere. So we need to use new uh, breeding methods and breeding tools to improve the, 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 the program. Okay, thanks, Dixon. You're referring to the, the genetic gains assessment that you're currently doing, the retrospective. Yeah, yeah yes, assessment. the 20-year genetic gains assessment. Yeah, yeah, yeah that will be very uh, informative. I see a couple of questions now posted into the chat. Um, the first one is from Ronnie Swenen. Um, uh, uh, so, Dixon, uh, uh, please define the highlands. Um, and what are the implications for um, Kenyan maize highland breeding uh, for other countries in East Africa? The, uh, okay, thank, thanks, thanks, Ronnie. The highlands, we start from 1,700 meters above the sea level and go up to 3,000 
uh, meters above the sea level. And uh, in the highlands, it is like we only have one cropping season. And the varieties there take from six to eight months to mature. And uh, for other countries neighboring Kenya, I think uh, most parts of Uganda, the, particularly the ones around Mount Elgon, places like Mbeya in Tanzania, they use most of the seed produced in Kenya by Kenya Seed Company. Thank you. Thank you, Dixon. I see um, a number of questions now coming up, so I'll, I'll go through them on the chat. And if you'd like to ask your question live on video, please feel welcome to do so. Um, and next is from uh, Jean Rubio. Uh, hi, Dixon. Thanks for the presentation. Despite the investments in maize breeding and seed systems, the maize yields remain low. Uh, what are the other game changes? The game changes to, um, I think, for the breeders, I think they have done good work because uh, the varieties which are really released at the moment are able to give up uh, up to 12 tons per hectare. But you see the averages on the farmer's fees are still at two, below two tons per hectare. I think there are other factors, maybe agronomic factors, they do not use the recommended rates of fertilizers and so on. And maybe they don't also get some uh, uh, concessions from the government, like uh, reduced prices of fertilizers and so on. So I think uh, for that, for the yields to improve, the agronomic part has to be considered seriously also, as much as we are doing our breeding. Hey, thanks, thanks a lot, Dixon, and, and thanks, uh, Jean-Claude, for that very pertinent question. Um, there's another question from Ronnie, but I, I will move to Claire. Chance to ask her first question. Um, how many Calro centers are involved in maize breeding, and how are these um, organized to respond to one market segment? Or do the different Calro breeding programs um, target different market segments? Thank you. Uh, Calro has got six breeding programs. The first one is the Highland program where I'm based, although I'm also the coordinator of all the other five programs. So there's the Highland program. Then we also have the mid altitude program based at a place called Embu in Kenya. Then we have a mid late, which is uh, between the mid and the Highland. A mid late a program at a place called Kakamega, and this one also deals with uh, striga breeding for striga uh, uh, resistance or tolerance around the lake region. Then we have another breeding center at a place called Moguga near Nairobi. They mainly deal with disease uh, resistance breeding. Then we have the uh, early uh, program which deals with the drought at a place called Katumani. Then we have another one called Mutwapa at the coast, mainly dealing with lowland uh, varieties. So those are the six programs in Kenya uh, because of the different agroecological zones. They cover the different agroecological agro zones in Kenya. Okay, thank you very much, Dixon. I, I think we have time for two more questions before we'll have to move into the next session. Uh, so we have a question from Patrick Stolt, uh, and he's asking, what is the percentage, what percentage of smallholder farmers buy hybrid seed in Kenya? So what is the rate of hybrid adoption in Kenya? In the highlands, 90% of the farmers use hybrid seed. They know hybrid seed and they know the badness or the uh, they, 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 they know the badness of using uh, the local seed or advanced generation seed. Okay. Um, so in the highlands, 90% of the farmers buy hybrid seed every year. Okay, and, and a follow-up from Patrick was, can they afford hybrids? And I, I presume they can, if 90% have adopted. Okay. Um, and then we have, uh, we'll take one final question from Yosef Beyeni, uh, and he's asking, 
How do you see a genetic diversity uh, of highland maize in Kenya and Eastern Africa? And do you see any need to broaden the genetic diversity of highland maize germplasm? Yeah, I think we can broaden. I said we, are, we have almost reached a plateau. And if we can get more germplasm to pump into what we have, then it would be very good. And I think Simit should help us uh, in doing this so that we can broaden the genetic base. 